so much, Zach. Uh, Zachary Kopp is a very good friend of mine. He and I met when I was in school, when I was a freshman, back, I would say, about eight years ago. It was a long time ago. And, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 12 years ago, actually. And um, he and I have been best friends, encouraging each other in the Lord. And I trust that during his time here, he will be a blessing to you as well. So thank you so much, Zach. It was a pleasure singing with you. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. We uh, resume going on into our Psalms series, God's Hymnal. We're on message number 14 in our series. We spent the last six weeks going through Psalm 23, uh, a journey together as a church. And, and I'm glad the Lord, he taught us so many things. And, and, lost my train of thought. And I was blessed to preach through it. But there are so many more Psalms the uh, Lord, I believe, wants us to go through. So, we're still in our series. Psalm 25. We will only read up to verse 14. Psalm 25, all the way up to verse, verse 1, all the way down to verse 14. A Psalm of David. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee. Do I wait all the day? Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Let's pray. Father, we look into your word once again this afternoon, and we are so grateful to be together as a church Thank you for opening up our building once again. Lord, we continue to pray for our leaders as they lead us through phase two starting Monday. And Lord, I pray for more uh, Bible-believing churches around the city. Lord, would you uh, can open their doors and open their uh, d doors of opportunity to minister in these days. Lord, we ask that you meet with us in this hour. Lord, I ask for your Spirit's power to be on your Word as it's declared this afternoon. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Give me the right words that you want me to say. Help me to be simple and not complicated. And I pray that the listener online would be blessed and challenged and even make a decision based on what they hear today. Lord, I ask all these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Throughout the centuries, sailors have looked to the heavens for direction. One star that they 
would observe clearly is the North Star. Why? Because it was, and it still is, a very bright star. We, in New York City, live in the Northern Hemisphere. We are north of the equator. And so we would see that star in our northern skies. Now, what sailors would do is, to determine how far north they were, what they would do is they would measure the angle between the star, uh, the North Star, and the horizon. The higher the anger, angle, the closer they were to the North Pole, the more north they were. It was so dependable, the North Star, because its position never changed. And it still hasn't changed. Where it is, it's still there. It hasn't moved. It will always be found in our northern skies. Now, they had to pay close attention to it because if they didn't look to it or look at it constantly, they would be heading in the wrong direction. Now, you and I, we are going through the seas of life, and if we are honest with ourselves, we are always in need of guidance and direction. You and I do not even know what will happen tomorrow. We don't know what lies ahead in our lives, especially in our day when there's so much uncertainty, whether it be from a national standpoint, from the economy, the coronavirus, the riots. We do not know what will happen to our nation. But even in our own lives, individuals, we are individuals. We're not just a nation. We are individuals. We all have separate lives. And we have a, a, a set of uncertainties in our life. David here he had some uncertainties as well. He needed guidance from God. He constantly looked to the Lord for it and trusted that he would give it to him. Look in verses 1 and 2. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. He was constantly and completely dependent on the Lord his God, for direction. Why? Because God never changes. You see, the North Star, sailors constantly looked to it because it was in a fixed position. And God is fixed. He doesn't move and he doesn't change. We find in Malachi 3, verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. We should trust the Lord, lest we go in the wrong direction in the seas of life. And I want you to walk out of here learning that in this psalm, there are things that we can ask God for, but it also shows us the kind of heart we must have to receive it. I want you to learn that you must be continually dependent upon the Lord for your steps throughout your Christian life. I entitle the message, Keeping Our Eye on Our Spiritual North Star. God is our North Star, so to speak. He is the one who gives us direction, and he also tells us where we are and where we should be. You see, the sailors, based on where they were in relation to the horizon and the star, they knew, okay, I'm too far south. Maybe I should go f further north. God not only gives us direction where we should go, but he also shows us that we aren't in the right direction, and we should follow. Here are some requests for God's guidance. I want to look into that this afternoon. The requests for God's guidance. There are five that I find in this psalm. Uh, there could be more uh, based on the whole counsel of 
God's word, but I want to streamline it to just five that we find in the psalm today. Number one, the request for God's ways. Look in verse four. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Show me thy ways. This was a request that David had to God. It could mean a few things, two things. Number one, show me thy ways means show me your tendencies, O Lord. Show me how you work, what you're doing. In the Bible, there are some spiritual laws by which God has ordained for life and also the Christian life. Not only just life, whether it be with believers or and unbelievers, but even with specifically with believers. Now, here's one that could uh, that relates to anybody. For example, Galatians six seven: Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is a tendency. That is a spiritual law. God says, I will not be mocked. Whatever you put into your life, whatever you sow your life into, that is what you're going to reap. When you put tomato seeds into the soil, you'll grow tomatoes. You're not going to grow corn. You're not going to grow broccoli or peppers. You're going to grow tomatoes. Well, you sow to the flesh. Verse 8 in Galatians 6. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now that's to the Christian. Christian, you sow to the flesh, you will reap up flesh. You sow to the Spirit. You let the Holy Spirit dominate your Christian life and you will reap life everlasting blessings in your Christian life, not just material, but spiritual. You find joy, peace, contentment, love, and many more. We also find, when it comes to God's tendencies, His dealings with us. We begin to know what God is teaching us as we do His will. Sometimes we ask the Lord to show us what He's teaching us, but maybe, maybe it might be too early for us to know exactly what it is, so we should just ask him, Lord, thank you for teaching me something. And in time, you'll figure it out. We understand his dealings as we learn and as we grow and as he teaches us. God's ways can also mean the road that he has tailor-made for us. The word ways in verse 4 means, it has a few definitions in Hebrew. One is a road. A road. Now, this, I think, must be talking about a specific direction that God has for individual lives. Roads are easily marked. They have mile markers. Uh, if you go to, uh, if you drive on any interstate, you'll have mile markers on the right side of the road. They could be either paved with asphalt, like we have today, or if you were in, the, in ancient times, uh, some roads might be, uh, for example, in Rome, they were cobblestones on the road, paved. Or it could be a clear path, but it may be just dusty. Another definition for road, for ways is journey. It could be something specific, but journey has the idea of something that's overarching. An overarching plan that he has for our lives. Going back to the idea of interstates, if you ever looked in a Rand McNally or if you look at Google Maps, you'll find that interstates in our, in our country are very long. They were built uh, under President Eisenhower. He uh, developed the Eisenhower interstate system. This pur The purpose for interstates, God forbid we ever had to fight at home fight our enemies at home, the military would have easy access from one city to the next. That was the purpose. And these interstates are 
directed. They were built strategically. And these interstates have major steps, major stops along the way. Since we're in New York City, one interstate that we have is Interstate 80. Where does it start? Well, you cross the George Washington Bridge, you just started, started Interstate 80. You keep on going west, you cross New Jersey, then you cross into Pennsylvania, another stop, a major stop in Pennsylvania is Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You keep on going, you end up in Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio is a major city on I-80. You keep on going, Chicago. And I say that with hesitation because I've been on Chicago traffic. It is horrendous. That's a joke. It really is. <laughs> so you make a long stop on, at Chicago through I-80. You keep on going. You find yourself in Iowa. Keep on going in Iowa, you end up in Omaha, Nebraska. You keep going through Nebraska, you go to Denver, Colorado. Keep on going in I-80, you go to Salt Lake City, Utah. Keep on going, you end up in Reno, Nevada. And then at the very end of I-80 is San Francisco, California. These are major cities along the way you go through I-80. God's overarching plan is like an interstate. And as we stay on that plan, God may have major stops for us that we have to take as we go through his, the journey. And as we trust him, we can look back at how he's led us through these major stations in our life. For example, salvation is the first stop on your journey, your Christian journey. For me, I was, I was at age seven. Then I became a teenager. I, I uh, got baptized when I was 15. Then I went on to Christian college. That's another major stop for my life. And then I graduated from college. Then I went into full-time ministry. That's another stop. My first stop was in Iowa, ministry-wise. And then I came to back home, another stop. Then I went down to North Carolina for my master's degree. That was another major stop in my life. Then, marriage. That was another major stop for me. And I don't know what the next stop for me will be. But I'm still on the road that God has for me. The overarching plan that he has for my life. Here's another request. Verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Paths can mean road like an interstate, something very easy to see. It's marked, it's, it has lanes, but it can also mean path, uh, which means uh, it can also be something like a state road or a local street, or it could be a path that was created by ruts. It looks a little dusty, maybe it's something that you and I don't wanna travel on, or it's a road less traveled. These may be the roads of the lessons that God wants to teach us before we move on to that major stop. He may want us to, to veer a little bit to say, hey, son or daughter, I want to teach you something. I want you to go here. There's something I want to teach you. That means we must be willing to go on whatever path God has for us, no matter how rough it may be. Here's a poem. It said, I said, the author, you, she wrote, I believe it's a she, she said, quote, I said, let me walk in the fields. God said, no, walk in the town. I said, there are no flowers there. He said, no flowers, but a crown. I said, but the sky is black. There's nothing but noise and din. He wept as he sent me back. There is more, he said. There is sin. I said, but the air is thick, and fogs are veiling the sun. He answered, yet souls are sick, and souls in the dark undone. I said, I shall miss the light, and friends will miss me, they say. He answered, choose ye tonight, if I am to miss you or they. I pleaded for time to be given, 
He said, Is it hard to decide? It will not seem hard in heaven to have followed the steps of your guide. I cast one look at the fields, then set my face to the town. He said, My child, do you yield? Will you leave the flowers for the crown? Then into his hands went mine, and into my heart came he, and I walk in the light divine, the path I had feared to see. The point of the poem, no matter where God leads you, it may be the, less, the road less traveled, you'll find God's light there. As he's the he's walking with you in it wherever God leads you follow where he leads me I will follow third request God's truth God's truth verse 5 lead me in thy truth this is a request for the truth which brings with it don't miss this the need to discern what is the road that he has for us? What is the, the uh, interstate that he wants us to be on? Or the state road or the little side street or the path that's less traveled? The, the road that he wants us to be on instead of the plan Satan wants us to follow. While God's working, in us and leading us. Satan vies for our attention. He wants us to get distracted and get off the road. And I know of stories of Christians who made a wrong decision somewhere on the interstate of God's overarching plan. They were where God wanted them to be. Somewhere along the line, they made a wrong decision, and they ended up wrong. They went in a different direction. Spiritually, vocationally, not that it's wrong for a vocational change, but if it's wrong if it's not what God wants you to do. Uh, sin entered into the picture, and it's heartbreaking that some of these Christians were soldiers, in battle for the Lord, but they became casualties because of a wrong decision they made, because Satan had something that got their attention. Verse 6, Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses. Focus on tender mercies there. It's a request for his compassion as he leads us, as a shepherd leads his sheep. If you remember our Psalm 23 series, we learned that the shepherd would apply the oil to the sheep's head and nose so that the flies that wanted to breed into the sheep's moist nose wouldn't fly all over and hatch eggs in there and give the sheep great irritation. Rather, all the flies would go away and the sheep would be able to roam in the pasture freely without any torment. There are times when a sheep would fall on its feet and be cast with its legs up dangling in the air and not able to get back up while the shepherd is right there to bring, to bring them upright. The shepherd leads his sheep through the valleys, the dark times, well, our shepherd gives us the oil of the Holy Spirit as we go and experience irritations and torments in our life that uh, cripple our Christian life. He, when we fall, when we're cast, picks us back up and gets us going again. And he leads us through the valleys. These are tender mercies of God. And as we are walking with him, he will show us his tender mercies. You find in James chapter 5, verse 11, talking about Job, ye have seen the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that he is pitiful 
and of tender mercy. God delights in giving his people his tender mercies, his guidance through life. He's always there. And lastly, his loving kindness. You read the end of verse 6, thy loving kindnesses. It's his goodness and his faithfulness that he gives to everybody. He's good and faithful to all. His children see it, though. Now, these are the requests that we should ask the Lord as we go through life. And he wants to grant them to us. But there's a hindrance from us receiving these requests. Verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. The hindrance to God's guidance in our life is sin. The hindrance to God's guidance is sin. Now, we find in verse 7. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Remember not. It's not a request that David's saying that he's not asking God, God, forget the sins that I did. Somehow, God, would you erase it out of your memory? God can't do that. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows every sin that you and I have committed. It's not a request of forgetting. Rather, it's a request for God to not take into account his past sin. David is asking God to not let his past sin keep him from knowing God's best. Lord, there are times when I have failed you before in my past. Lord, I have, I have forsaken them. Lord, I'm done with them. I still want your best. Don't let my past cause me to miss your best for me. I believe with all my heart, God is a God who restores. He restoreth my soul. That was the point of Psalm 23. When we're cast, he brings us back up if we allow him to. When we are willing to admit our fault, our guilt, and our sin before God and before those whom we have offended, he brings us back up. Psalm 103, verse 4, who healeth our iniquities, it says. He heals us from past failures. Here's an answer, here's an illustration for you. Has anyone in here, you don't have to answer the question, but maybe in your own heart and mind, has anyone ever denied the Lord three times in front of other people before? Peter did. Yet, God forgave him. Jesus, the Son, his Savior, his Master, forgave him. You read John 21. And God used him mightily to reach the people that were celebrating at Pentecost. 3,000 were converted on that day. In fact, God is so good and upright, he wants to teach us in the road he has for us, as long as we make the choice to keep his testimonies. Verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and testimonies. But we must be clean so that we can receive the guidance that we're asking. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He will not guide us if we are in open rebellion against him. Where are you disobedient to God? You're asking God for direction and guidance for your life. You don't know what to do. You're in a tight situation. Yet, there is somewhere in your life you are not willing to yield. You're not willing to yield. God will not give you the guidance until you yield that. God wants everything. What sin is it? Is it your pride? Is it your bitterness? Was there an offense that took place years ago and every time you think about it, it gets you angry and you want revenge? That will never work with God. That will never work. Joseph was 
badly mistreated. You find God's hand on his life, you read in Genesis. There's no way God would have his hand on Joseph's life if he was bitter towards his brothers. No way. It doesn't work that way. Are you watching things you shouldn't be watching? I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Psalm 101 verse 3. Whether it be on the computer, or whether it be in your DVD player, or on YouTube, or on Facebook. If Jesus was next to you, would he approve? Because he is next to you. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess means to say the same thing. That's the word in Greek, homo Call it what God has called it, sin. Now, here is a prerequisite for God's guidance. We talked about the requests, we talked about the hindrance, and now the prerequisite, my last point. Verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. That fear Him. What does it mean to fear God? All throughout the Proverbs, especially, especially Proverbs, you read verses that say, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. What is the fear of the Lord? This is my definition. It may not be perfect, but I think it fits it well. The fear of the Lord is this, a holy awe and reverence for God that makes the human being aware of his accountability to him. I'll repeat it. The fear of the Lord is a holy awe and reverence for God that makes the human being aware of his accountability to him. When Christians have fear for God, the fear of the Lord, they know and they walk day to day reminded that they are accountable to him, that he's watching and that we have a relationship with him. You see, the fear of the Lord makes us aware of who we are in front of God. Puny human, puny little creatures in comparison to the great God, our creator. It makes us conscious of his omni omnipresence and it gives us a healthy fear of sinning, of sin. It helps me think, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't be doing this. Whenever you have this a temptation, whatever it could be, it could be uh, something as you're walking, as you're uh, driving on uh, the road and you see a billboard that's inappropriate, you have this sense in your spirit, this is disgusting, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be looking at this, and you just focus on the road. This, that disgusting feeling that I don't want to do this because I can't handle this, and not only that, if it angers God, it, it displeases Him, that's the fear of the Lord. You have that because of God, a fear of God. You want to love him. Now, there are five blessings that we have, that God gives us when we have this fear. And this is what we need. This is the, the fear of the Lord, is what we need for his guidance. We're going through the seas of life and we need his guidance. Number one, verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. Number one, God will teach him in the way that he has chosen. Simply put, you'll know the direction that God has for you, that God wants you to take. Very simple. He will show you and guide you and give you peace, which is the second blessing. 
His soul will be at peace, verse 13. His soul shall dwell at ease. When we're in God's will, we have peace. It's another spiritual law that God has given. God is not the author of confusion, but peace. Number three. His or her children will reap the blessings of him or her following God. The man or woman who has children will also reap the blessings. Verse 13, it says, His seed shall inherit the earth. Kids, if you have parents that love the Lord, you should thank Almighty God that you do. Don't disrespect them. Don't disrespect them. There are kids out there who wish they had a dad and mom that loved the Lord. There are kids out there that don't even know who their father is or who their mother is. It is a blessing that you have parents or grandparents that love God and want to teach you his word. So that when you're old, when you get to be my age, you will not depart from God's word. And you'll still be on the right path. You'll still be on the path of blessing. And you're reaping benefits. It says it right here. His seed shall inherit the earth. That means descendants. That means you, children. You are the descendants of your parents. And you're reaping benefits for your parents following the Lord. Now, I'm sure your parents will admit to you that they're not perfect. No parent is. No parent is. But they have a heart to follow what God says and teach you accordingly. Do not be bitter at them. Do not be bitter at them. There are people my age, they can look back to, their, to the days when they're, when they're with their parents when they were younger and there was a time when their parents did wrong, of course, and they kept that anger for years and years and years. And you know what happens? They become, they become angry parents themselves. And then they lash it onto their kids. And when they, their kids grow up, they become angry parents. It's a cycle. Kids, love your parents. Thank God that you have godly parents. And if you don't have parents that love the Lord, do you have a mentor that loves you who is wanting to guide you in his word? Love them and love the Lord because you have them. Stick close to them. Verse 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. He will be given insight into God's word, which means he gets to know God's thoughts. And lastly, it says at the end of verse 14, he will show them his covenant. He will be kept in the promises of God. What the promises that God gives to you personally in your devotions, he intends to keep them. Because you're following him, but because he's also the God who's faithful. These are the blessings, the uh, benefits of having a fear of God. This is what happens when we have the fear of God. So, do you realize how dependent God must be? For your direction in life do you see you need to be dependent on him keep looking at your north star God and let the compass of his word guide you into the right steps that you need to make he promises to guide you if you follow but if you don't you'll be on the wrong direction. 
The story is told of a woman with a child who on board a train that was in the middle of a terrible blizzard. And the weather was slowing the train's progress. She was very concerned because she didn't want to get on the wrong station, off the wrong station. There was a specific station she wanted to get to and make sure she got there safely. She was very anxious about it, and a gentleman nearby saw her anxiety, and, she, and he said, Ma'am, don't worry. I know the road. I know where this train is headed. I'll let you know when it's your stop. The train stopped at a station. It was the station before the one the woman needed to come off. And so the gentleman said, ma'am, you're next to, you, the station that's next is yours. So she, he gave her a heads up. A few minutes later, just a few minutes later, the train stopped. And the gentleman said, ma'am, you can come off now, come off quickly. And the ma'am thanked him so much and she went off with her child in her arms out into the cold. Now, what happens next is interesting and it's actually shocking. The next stop, the brakeman of the train announced the station. It was the station that this woman was supposed to get off. The gentleman was confused. He said to him, sir, you stopped at this station already. The brakeman said, no, no, there was something wrong with the engine. So we had to stop to fix it. And then we got back going. The gentleman was in astonishment. He said, alas, I put that woman off in the storm when the train stopped between stations. He told wrong information to the woman. When they got to the station, they got off the train, went back, and they found a child in the arms of a woman frozen to death. Both died in the storm. All because they were misguided. Following our North Star, our spiritual North Star, is a big deal. There may be some Christian out there, you want God to lead you in a specific direction, but you know deep down in your heart it's not what God wants you to do. Perhaps you've been wanting counselors to give you approval of what you want, while all along they're telling you the opposite Will you not yield to the Lord? Will you not obey and trust Him? Because He promises He'll lead you and guide you into the light. It may be rough, but it will be the light. God promises to, to bless not only you and your family. May God help us to follow Him. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I ask that in these days that we would be people who are sensitive to your spirit. Lord, if there's anything in our lives that hinders us from knowing what you have for us to do, Lord, reveal it to us and may we be done with it. May we confess it as sin. And may we follow in the light of your word. Lord, Help us to keep this in mind this week. Lord, thank you that you want to guide us and you promise to do so if we obey. Lord, if there's a Christian that, that is struggling, Lord, would you help them to follow you because you love them? You have a special plan for them. Do a work in their hearts, I pray. Lord, bless, uh, Lord, our routines this week. Lord, if there's someone we need to talk to about you, would you lead us to them? We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have a great day.